lived in Lenore County in Kenston for 46 years, and I can't remember a flood as bad as Floyd. But I can tell you that as far as in my career with the fire service or even in emergency management, it's the biggest flood that I've ever dealt with. Um, and most of us here, it's the biggest thing we've ever dealt with. Lenore well, County is located in eastern North Carolina. Uh, we're about 60 miles from the, uh, from the coast, probably about 60 or 70 miles from Raleigh. You know, one of the things that, that does come to mind during Hurricane Floyd is we have a church located out here called Tabernacle Church. Um, they, they are in the floodplain, and in 96, they had had some floods from, from Hurricane Fran. I was uh, one of the charter members of the church. This land came available right here on Highway 70, and so it was uh, just a prime piece of property. Highway 70 in our county is the main artery through our county. That's how you go east and west in the state of North Carolina. Yeah, in 1976, we decided to build here. We looked at it uh, at that time and checked the uh, flood status on it. Actually, the church had uh, never had any water damage, uh, never even come close to flooding until 1996. Uh, and being in eastern North Carolina, we're quite familiar with hurricanes and the rainfall and predictions and everything. Hurricane Fran was the second hurricane to hit our area during uh, 1996. The first had been Bertha. But prior to Fran, the floodplain remained intact as a residential area and a development area on the west side of Kinston. And as a result, there were a lot of houses, there were a lot of businesses over there. Uh, it just produced a tremendous amount of rainfall, a tremendous amount of flooding. We received a call from the church uh, when the water started rising that they were going to try and keep the water out of the church and the fire department brought in some pumps that we had and the foster service had. My brother was pastor of the church at that time and we uh, devised a plan and uh, gathered the sandbags together. During Hurricane Fran there was a billboard right over the church with my face on it and finger pointing up the sky and said Skip said it would and uh, and of course they stood out around the church and prayed and, and there was some joke of yeah well he might have said it would but we we managed to keep the water from getting it. We felt like God had really blessed us, and He had. We were successful at that time keeping the, all of the water out. The carpet didn't even get wet. So we had a little bit of experience fighting flood water uh, when Floyd came through in 1999. In, in 99, um, of course, hurricane season had, had, was upon us, and you know, a little blip on the radar came up, showed a tropical wave out in the Atlantic, and then, uh, of course, it turned into a full-blown hurricane named Hurricane Floyd. Well, before we talk about Hurricane Floyd, you have to recognize that just a week before Floyd came, we had two passes of Hurricane Dennis and Tropical Storm Dennis. Dennis made it circle while we were pre-planning for Hurricane Floyd, and it set off the coast for three days, and Hurricane Dennis actually turned around and came through Kent's and dropped 10 inches of rain. So we knew at this point we would be in trouble if we had another hurricane. When Floyd developed, Floyd was what we call a Cape Verde storm, which means it developed way out in the ocean, big ridge of high pressure. The, the, the size of Floyd was very, uh, was, was very mind-boggling. Uh, it, was, it was big enough to cover half our state. As Floyd passed over the Bahamas about a week before it got here, it strengthened to a Category 5 hurricane on the Safer Simpson scale. So our, our tremendous concern at that point in time was with wind speed. We knew our rivers and streams were already up. So then, you know, our concern was not only wind with Floyd, but then how much water were we going to get with Floyd. Well, as far as the hurricane's concerned, I was just uh, the pastor only about a year. I had been through it as a youth pastor with the prior pastor before me, but it was the first time as the person at the helm of the ship, I guess you'd say. Well, as, as we realized Floyd was definitely going to have an impact on us, we had, um, we had meetings with our control groups and trying to educate all our emergency service personnel, first responders. Roger Dale always calls a meeting uh, prior to a hurricane and we have a one day pre-plan exactly what we're going to do and which way we're going to take the approach and uh, he enlightened us that this was a powerful hurricane. 
As Floyd moved on past the Bahamas and initially moved toward Florida and then turned and began to move northward up the east coast of the United States, it lost steam, it went down to a Category 3, went down to a Category 2, and then as it approached us on uh, September 16th in 1999, it approached us from the south. Our concern again was we were very wet. We had already gone through a wet period of time. We just had six to ten inches of rain come down. All the river basins are full. They're at their flood stage level. So our, our hope and our prayer in this case is that this storm's going to hit and this storm is going to run and come on through. It didn't. As Floyd came our way, it slowed down to a crawl and not only slowed down to a crawl, but as it was blocked, it expanded in size and eventually put down a rain canopy that delivered between 14 and 20 inches of rain all the way up river. I was at home and watched it rain and rain and I knew the creeks were high so I got out and started riding and within two or three hours the water had already started to cross the roads throughout the whole county. We saw the hurricane was going to be here and then we knew we were going to have a flood so we tried to make the necessary precautions by ordering some sand and making sure we had sandbags available to us. The rain was so, uh, I mean, it was torrential downfall. Uh, it was the most rain I had ever seen. It, it rained just solid, poured down raining for hours. rising to a le flood level greater than anything that we've had in the last 30 years. So that, that pre presents a great amount of problems. As the hurricane rolled through, rolled through our area, of we started receiving phone calls into the uh, into our emergency operations center, you know, with, with flooded flooded areas throughout the county. Okay, you said it was the vehicle in the water? People not being able to get their cars out, people couldn't get out of the houses, things like this. We got the first call, uh, it was like 10 o'clock at night. We went uh, with a couple of boats, we had lined some boats up, and we went over there to get it out. And uh, this was prior to the eye of the storm coming across. Uh, we had winds of around 100 miles per hour, and Roger had called us and kept us updated on where the storm was and when it was coming. Well then, they, the weather service gave us a call and said, we're giving you a heads up that the river is going to shoot past 23 feet. Uh, so then we had the marshal resources to send over to, to Rivermont and the other areas of our county that we knew flooded in, in Hurricane Fran to start doing evacuations and, and helping people in those areas. Well actually, I spent the night here at the church as we were realizing things weren't going to go too well for us. We were asleep here at the church. and. We awakened during the night to keep a check on the floodwaters. We saw them coming in pretty quick. We had rescued about 10 or 15 people maybe. And, uh, and Roger said, you've got to get out. So the, the worst of it's coming. Uh, you know, we had people still in there hollering, people hanging out the windows, had seven, eight foot of water in the house. And we just couldn't leave these people. So we kept rescuing and I'm gonna tell you, it got real bad. We got real scared. And we knew it was dangerous, we knew we could lose our life. So as we saw the floodwaters coming in, we began to call the folks and tell them we needed their help to rally around uh, to get in here with us. Well, when our folks respond to a call when we have a need, it's amazing, really, uh, that our people, uh, uh, they just come together. I guess a crisis is when you see what your folks really are. And our folks, when we call them, they just respond immediately. You're on candy camera. When I got here, the water was already at floor level before we ever started building a wall. We had some idea on how to fight flood water at that time, and so uh, we really felt good. So naturally, when the river flooded in 99, uh, we, we knew that we could you know, keep the water out. We had experience at it. So myself, uh, I was kind of in charge of building the wall and trying to keep the water out because I had experienced it before. The water kept coming, kept coming. We had roads through the county that were closed and finally on the second night we had water that actually started coming across Highway 70, out on 70 the bypass. 
the thought that went through my mind was that there are just a tremendous number of people who are in houses where the water is going to come up more rapidly than they've ever seen and there's going to be a lot of people who either get killed or very nearly get killed from flooding. The water came up very quickly because there was no place for it to go as it surged downstream from all of that rainfall. So what went through my mind, there's a lot of people in big trouble. Uh, we were helping out Tabernacle Church. Attention Southwood. We got a call from 911 Center asking if we could furnish some fire hose, pumps, anything like that. And I said, well, the fire department's here to help you, anything we can do. Well, we had a Christian flag that was flying uh, up there, and we had to leave the flag up because we believe, number one, that the flag is a symbol of our inward faith in the Lord. So when we knew that if we had to close Highway 70 that it would essentially just shut us completely down as far as you know, anybody being able to come in or get out of Kinston in Lenore County. And we stayed 24 hours a day uh, working around the clock because we had to keep the pumps running. Some of them were gas operated pumps so we had to keep them filled with gas. Initially, because the floodwaters was coming in so quick, we didn't have time to fill the sandbags, so we built a plywood wall uh, all the way around the building uh, with plastic and plywood, embraced it with two befores, and then we had more time to start filling sandbags, and we started building the sandbag wall inside the plywood wall. And uh, so it was constant work. I, we filled thousands and thousands of sandbags. One of the problems we encountered, um, we were dealing with numbers that had never been dealt with before as far as rainfall totals. So it was hard for the River Forecast Center to actually get a handle on just how much our river was going to rise during Hurricane Floyd. So it, dealing with that and, and, and knowing that, you know, we said, okay, we'll prepare for a Fran Floyd or a Fran Flood. You know, Fran happened in 96 and our river went to 23.3 in that case. So we said, okay, we'll prepare for a friend. And well, of course, it went, it went shot past friend the second day. But the water kept rising. It would rise like a foot. Seemed, seemed like in 30 minutes. I know it took a couple of hours, but it was rising so fast that uh, we were having trouble getting the people out in time. I mean, people would be on top of the houses before we could get to them. In some places we had water that was 10, 15 foot high. It would go up to the roof on a house. The problem that we got into there was a, a, a once in a hundred year situation, maybe a once in a 500 year situation. Once you get to the middle of Kinston, that river basin broadens out under the bridge on Queen Street. You can see the river gets broader, but even though the river gets broader, there was nowhere for the water to go because downstream from Newburn, the northeast wind was pushing the water up. And the bottom line is for the first time, since 1919, the east side of Kinston, Highway 70 flooded. Well, sure enough, we had we did have to close Highway 70 the second night. And I can remember calling our DOT rep and I asked him, I said, well, we need to close 70. What other alternatives do we have? And I remember he made the statement to me. He said, there are no more alternatives. That's it. When we close 70, that's it. So sure enough, we had to close 70 because the water got so high and it just got too dangerous for, for traffic to continue through there. We closed it. You know, everyone told us, well, it's going to rise just a couple of more inches and it'll level off. And so we always had hope. I mean, we always, you know, we kept that hope going. Well, I guess the thing that continually crossed my mind is that I had to continue to trust in God because if I were to let down, then that would discourage the other folks. So I continually remained here to be here to encourage the folks and to fight with them. The next day, um, we, we took a helicopter and then made an aerial survey of our county and, and realized pretty quick that basically we were divided up into four islands, almost. I mean, we had four islands in our county that you could not get to basically by car. You either had to use boat or you had to use air, air means to get there, um, which is what we had started doing, you know, evacuating people by air as well as the National Guard came in and started bringing people out and carrying them to our shelters. Some houses we'd have to duck under the water and go in the window in order to get the people out. Well, we were thinking, Lord, you better help us because we're going to lose some people. Uh, we could lose some of our firemen. 
It was probably as emotional a time as I can ever remember because of the massive scope of the destruction and the huge number of people that were affected uh, and, and there was absolutely nothing they could do. You know, it's something in, in our wildest imaginations here in our county. I mean, we've had floods before, we've dealt with them, but I think it's something we never realized where we would actually divide the county up into separate quadrants, I guess for lack of a better term, to where we just couldn't get to them, just could not get to people. It, it was rising to the level you just couldn't believe. We would mark the road and watch the water come up the marks on the road. It's amazing how fast it would come up. And we had animal rescue that started running almost immediately with just horrible situations where the water would come up so quickly, we'd come up in a boat and we'd see a dog's tail or the hind section of a dog and realize it was still chained, that it had drowned because the water rose so quickly that it couldn't get off the chain. that ran off the road and uh, on his way to work one morning in a big canal and didn't find it until the water went down. There was a gentleman perished in it. The Lord said that uh, when he flooded the earth the first time he wouldn't do it again and he'd give us a rainbow as that symbol. And uh, I was starting to wonder a little bit, uh, you know, where's the rainbow? <laughs> Prior, just a few days before the flood and even after the flood, my message has always dealt with the fact that God uh, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that though hard times come, He won't leave us, He'll always be there. So I encourage the folks in that direction to, to trust in God. We watched Tabernacle and we knew they had a lot of faith. And it took approximately 20 people at the time to man this barrier that they had around the church. And uh, we knew we did it the first time. We didn't see a problem the second time. You know, we said this is a good testimony. So a wonderful testimony for the Lord. And uh, we would tell them, you know, we'll be able to do it again. We'll be able to do this, not knowing what we were going to encounter. So I had to remain encouraged and I did that sometimes by getting alone by myself and taking time to pray. I saw um, in my pastor one of the strongest men I've ever seen. Uh, he was a very young pastor. Uh, he had just became pastor of the church. Uh, that was his first year. When other folks were battling, I would get, get alone for a little while. Then I'd come back and we'd fight together. And he never I mean, never allowed us to give up. He never gave up. Um, he would disappear sometimes for an hour or two, and, and when we would find him, he would be in a secluded spot praying. He knew that if, if we were successful, it would be because God helped us. And all he wanted to do was do God's will. And we didn't want to build a sandbag wall. It would have been very easy for us to just say, well, the flood came and, and let the waters in to begin with. But we wanted to perform God's will. They actually uh, helped the fire department by maintaining the several days and nights. Uh, they stayed there 24 hours a day. Somebody was awake all the time working. Uh, we roamed the nights and the days. So it was, it was an outstanding uh, adventure to see. When we went out, when we got out there, I can remember, you know, there were piles and piles of sand, sandbags, 
They had even rented a machine to come in and actually fill up sandbags, kind of like a conveyor belt. So it was constant work. I, we filled thousands and thousands of sandbags. Every hour uh, we had rotating shifts uh, when someone would work until they just got completely exhausted and they would go in the building, take a nap for a couple of hours and someone else would take their place. Take sand up a conveyor belt and dump it into bags and you tie the bags up and they would take boats and carry it out or to, to help build the wall. Every hour there was at least uh, 20 to 25 men that were working nonstop, even in the uh, early hours of the early morning uh, we were continuously working. Uh, the biggest things was just uh, rotating around the pumps, making sure that they were working. We had uh, 28, I think it was, 28 pumps that were running all the time. Uh, and they were, uh, you know, like I said, they were getting stopped up sometimes. We would have to clean the filter out from debris and trash that would get into the pumps. I believe I talked to the pastor of that church. You know, and we were talking, and I told him, I said, you know, please, whatever you do, please make sure that if this wall gives away, there's nobody trapped between the wall and the, and the wall of the church itself. The wall would sometimes cause, uh, would collapse, and we would have to rebuild sections of the wall where it was weak at. Because all the water that would come rushing in, we were really scared that obviously somebody could get trapped in there and, and of course, be seriously injured or, or killed. The flood and the, the hurricane came, and as the hurricane winds beat, uh, it pretty well tore our flag up and it was tattered. Uh, we were fighting water the entire time. But in the times of fight, sometimes things get torn and, and they get disrupted, and they might look rough. We thought the water would stop about a foot high, and so that's what we were prepared for, and then they said it would come up another six inches, so we had to keep building the wall higher and higher and higher. But the thing is, is the, the symbol that was there that it was still flying high. It was a hard struggle, it was a hard battle. And though it was beat in the storm, though it was torn, it was still gonna make it. But no one ever says that it was a rose garden trying to serve Christ. I mean, if he went to the cross and gave his life, gave everything for us, uh, we can fight, we can have a few struggles in this life ourselves. The anchor holds. And regardless how tough the wind gets, the anchor is always solid. So we got to trust in him. And some people uh, outside of the community wondered why we fought so hard. That's what it's all about. It's about uh, being stewards of God's property. You take a person uh, as we looked at each other and we would talk and uh, it was in the back of our minds that there's a possibility this might not work this time, but then we'd push it out as fast as it would come in that, no, we'll make it work. You know, the Lord's on our side. Uh, we'll be able to stick together and we'll show the people community what you can do with your faith. But we were uh, a morale booster for the entire county. We realized that uh, the community had their eyes on us. And even today, it, it gets very emotional because the people of the community, uh, they helped us. And uh, because they were cheering for us and because they were offering a helping hand, it kept our spirits up. And there were, I'm, you know, I'm just guessing probably there were a hundred and some people that, that were out there and as well as parked on the shoulder of the road, you know, cheering on, cheering them on, I guess for lack of a better term, you know, hoping against hope, praying the whole nine yards, you know, hoping that that this would work. So it was a very gallant effort by, by the, uh, the, all the volunteers that were trying to save this church. That, that's kind of why it became a rallying point, I guess, for, for us here in our county. We had people bringing us pumps and the National Guard helped us uh, for a while sandbagging and uh, there was just so much help that came to us and uh, I just wish that I could explain uh, what's in my heart, the thankfulness that I have to those people. Other folks were able to see what we were doing during the flood and they would drive by and they would say, man, that's a great story how you're fighting for your church. But they didn't realize we were just fighting for a church building, but at the same time, 
It was enabling us to get the message of God out, that God would help his people. But sometimes we gotta do some work ourselves. It's just not uh, something he's gonna hand to us all the time. We've gotta be busy working. When the water got up to the top of the sandbags, that was probably three and a half feet. Uh, we hadn't experienced this in the first hurricane a couple years prior. Uh, we knew we were in trouble then. At that time, uh, we saw that we were starting to do more damage to the property by trying to keep the water out than we would to let it in. We had brought in extra pumps and extra fire hose and pumped the water out as much as we could, but they let us know that they have a little bit of water that was seeping in. I saw that uh, the floor was starting to rise uh, in the larger areas of the church. Uh, they were having some pressure on the inside of the church. Uh, the construction of the church was a cement slab floor and the water was trying to push the cement slab up. We, we knew that it was getting to a dangerous point. If the sandbag wall collapsed and water came in, uh, the electricity was still on in the building, uh, you know, the floor could rupture and groundwater could come up through the floor, and we were literally uh, getting to the point where the building was trying to float, uh, just like a boat. We knew if we didn't relieve some pressure that it would just raise the floor and it would demolish the church anyway. So we had the ch <clears throat> women and children to uh, leave the interior of the church and go out to uh, the highway, which was higher property. And only the men remained inside. It was a very emotional time. Uh, we, we had to make some decisions uh, on what we were going to do. We did keep our eyes on the news. We saw that it was not just localized in this area, but every river in eastern North Carolina was flooding. That's when we realized that it, it was God's will to, for water to get inside the building, and we realized that we just had to uh, succumb to that. Well, when I knew that it was time that the fight basically was over, uh, that we had to let the water in, uh, it was a time of despair. There are some things about it that made you realize that you'd kind of lost the, the battle. It was a hard decision. Uh, we looked at the potential danger, uh, the potential hazard, um, and we didn't want to give up. We, we wanted to fight. Uh, we looked at all the possibilities of trying to put pressure on the floor. Uh, trying to equalize the pressure in some other way other than uh, allowing the water to come in. Uh, but there was no, there was just no way. I gathered the men around that were here and we were then on a skeleton crew because we'd send everybody else home. Uh, but as I gathered them around, I said, guys, it's time for us to, to give up this fight. We need to to let the water in. Uh, it was meant, uh, God meant for the property to flood. Um, and we had to accept that. And in that meeting, that's what we realized that it was God's will for the building to be flooded. And so uh, we knew that we had done all that was possible. Uh, and that's all that God expects out of us to do the very best we can. And we had done that. And God had allowed us to do that because uh, trying to hold back three foot of water is a major ordeal and we have been successful at it. Uh, emotionally we were attached to the building and uh, we didn't want it to be damaged and so we fought it the best we could. And I said how much I appreciated everything that they had done and how that it was good to have a group of men that could come together for that for that need and we began to talk a little bit and we sat there and we cried together uh, we fellowshiped a little bit, we prayed. We asked God to, to protect our church even amidst the time that we're having to leave and th though the water has to come in, you know, help the damage to be minimal as we leave. So I let all the other men you know, go off then and I stayed by myself and just reassured myself in prayer that the Lord was still in control. And I was the last one to walk out toward the front of the building as they were there. And I said, I want you guys to let me let the water in. It's my church under my direction. It's God's church. 
and, and you know they came into my office and told me they being the emergency operations center staff one of the operation manager came in and told me said Roger we're just letting you know we just received a phone call and of course, the wall gave away at the church, and I made the statement to him. I said, "Well, I just it hadn't been that long ago. I just left. Is everybody out? Because I was very concerned that maybe some some people had been in in the area trying to help hold the wall or or uh, refortify it, I guess, to try to help keep the waters out. So my main concern was that somebody had got trapped. We went to the back side of the building and removed sandbags uh, in one area and allowed the water to start coming in slowly. And so I took the sledgehammer, I believe it was at that time, and broke the first hole into the wall to let the water begin to, to come into the building. Well, actually, the first thought was uh, it was a little scarier than I anticipated. I was there and the water began to flow in at a rapid pace, four, four foot of water standing outside the church building. Now it begins to flood in through this hole that we just made in the building or in that wall. But as it turned out, nobody was in there. And so therefore, while the building, the building was devastated as far as flood was concerned, we didn't have a loss of life in that area, which we were very fortunate on. As the water level started rising in the building, we went to the front of the building and removed the section there. As I saw the floodwaters come in, I just thought to myself, you know, here it is, we've fought now for these three and a half, four days, and and now the floodwaters are coming in. And it's almost, almost as if uh, it was time wasted, but I knew it wasn't because we had fought hard and we'd done our job. I was not there when the water was let in the church. Uh, I think uh, the emergency director, Roger Dale, let us know that the church had cut the pumps off and, and backed out. How much worse is it going to get is what I was thinking whenever he told me that. Uh, you know, is this the end? Is it fixing to go down or is it just going to keep getting worse? Emotionally, it was, it was devastating to us. It, it, uh, it nearly destroyed us emotionally. Yes, that was extremely hard for all of us. Well, a lot of people think if they're in trouble, they'll call the fire department. The fire department come and they'll rescue you, you know. And, we used to being able to control the environment that we go to. Uh, in this case, we could not. I think for us on a local level, the church was a symbolic effort of, of trying to to stop, you know, some type of stop damage from a particular area. It was a rallying point for a lot of people in our county. So when the wall gave away, you know, it, it was heartbreaking to see all the work that went into it. Um, it was not enough. It was just not enough. In Floyd, it just, uh, it, it was impossible to save the church, and, and I think the, the members of that church probably accept that pretty on. It, it certainly was a once-in-a-lifetime event uh, for me as a meteorologist, for the members of that church, and, and frankly, for everybody that lives in eastern North Carolina. We allowed the water to come in the building when it uh, was three foot um, above the floor level and it kept rising even after that until it got about five foot above the floor level. And a lot of people ask us, uh, you know, why we did that. Of course, as I said earlier, we're stewards of God's property and we were trying to take the best care of it that we could and we didn't want to do more damage by trying to be successful at finding the flood water. All we were trying to do was do what God wanted us to do. Well, the time I wondered where the Lord was in everything was probably the day that I got home after the flood was over. My wife and I couldn't stay anywhere. All the motels were filled. I'd lost my wallet in the floodwaters, had no money. We finally got home and I laid there in the living room floor and thought to myself, you know, all this fight and here we are and I was discouraged. We felt like maybe we felt like Noah did during the flood because we couldn't understand it. Uh, we couldn't see tomorrow. You know, we only see at the present time, but God sees tomorrow and He knew what He had down the road for us. At that very moment, we ourselves felt like a failure. But God, uh, in the still of the night, 
uh, when we went home and uh, we got by ourselves, each man to himself, and uh, we had a time where God could speak to us. So my mind, I guess a little bit of it was that I was feeling a little sorry for myself because we had lost the church building to the flood. But a part of that was realizing that God's still in control regardless. You know, God owns it all. He, he could have held the floodwaters back if he had wanted to. Uh, his will was exactly as it happened. Uh, we're not meant to change God's will. We're meant to live through it. But as I said, it only took a few days and the blessings of God and, and we regrouped and pulled back together and, and we realized that it was only a building and we knew that the church was still strong. The church isn't the building. The church is the congregation that meets in the building and the spirit that draws that uh, group of people together, the spirit of Christ. And we realized that, so we didn't lose the church. We lost the building that the church was housed in. But you know, the amazing thing about it was our folks began to call and they were checking on me. Preacher, you doing all right? You know, preacher, is everything okay? And I realized if my folks were doing okay after the flood, why shouldn't the preacher be able to trust God and realize that God would meet his needs also? I did see the pastor and of course, you know, they were disappointed, but again, they were very positive. All you heard was, we shall build back. I mean, it, we will build this thing back. And so after a couple of days, I decided, hey, it's time to get up. It's time to go back to work. Uh, soon after the flood, we started to clean up. Uh, we knew that we had to build a new building. Uh, so we uh, started the project. We had a lot of help. Uh, one of the airlines, a uh, group of people came in from the airline, helped us clean up the old building. Uh, we had uh, monetary gifts uh, from several churches uh, to help us with the expense of the uh, cleanup. Um, it took us several months to get it cleaned up. Um, we started meeting at another location in an old theater that we renovated and started having church in. And then on the weekends, we would work in the old building, getting it cleaned up. When I look back and I see what the Lord's done, it's, it's just amazing. And about six months prior to the flood, I was looking around and trying to decide what we were going to do as a church to grow and expand. And we looked at this land and just by a miracle, we were able to purchase this property. And after purchasing this property, little did we know that the flood was going to come and that we were going to need a place to build another building. And after we had the flood and we saw what God was trying to do through preparations that we didn't even understand, then we were able to place this building here on this new property and raise it up to hopefully where we don't have to worry about another flood. And now we have this beautiful facility that God has given us. We were very proud of it. You know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful building and this is God's house. Well, that flag remained for several days after the flood, and then we took that flag and we retired that flag as a good soldier of the cross. Uh, we used it, and then we put up a brand new one in its place when we got the building cleaned up. Well, shortly after the flood, we received a picture of a rainbow that encompassed or covered the whole entire property of the church, and it, it was centered right over the church building. And they thought, what an awesome picture that was, a reminder of how Noah went through the flood and God sent a rainbow and said that we won't have a flood again because of that. And when you saw that beautiful rainbow over top of the church, it, it just reminded you of that little assurance that God was still in control. He was still, He knows what's going on. Some people say, well, you know, if God was so strong, then why didn't He save the church? Uh, he allowed us two weeks to, to stand and work and show people that we had the faith to hold the water off. Oh, up toward the north. I, I think Hurricane Floyd taught me that, that in catastrophes, action is critical. And that when things happen, don't necessarily wait for somebody to tell you what to do. And don't drag your feet to take action. Get busy and do the best you can as quickly as you can.
And we get asked, I used to get asked all the time, you know, Roger, how many people were affected in Lenore County with this flood? And my answer then and today has always been that we've got a population of 60,000. And 60,000 people were affected, either directly or indirectly. Hurricane Floyd was an expense of a lifetime, uh, probably one of the greatest pieces of history that I've experienced. Uh, I hope to never experience it again. You know, when you look and, and see the new construction going on in our county, uh, especially in areas that were flooded, uh, where people have gone in and made repairs, like the church out on Highway 70 in Tabernacle Church. Now having said that, obviously we had other churches that were flooded. Um, that received just as much impact or devastation as what the church on Highway 70 did. And they've come back as well. So again, it goes back to the congregation of these churches and, and their undying belief that they're gonna have a place to worship and, and they're gonna overcome. And through tragedies and through trials and through uh, different things such as the flood of 99, we grow stronger with Christ. Today, you can relate back to the flood and uh, ask people if they remember one thing in particular. A lot of them will remember Tabernacle Church, keeping the water out of the church. And what I want folks to be able to see through our church is a church that fought through adversity and triumphed over tragedy. We triumphed of the fact that we didn't let this flood get us down, that it didn't destroy us. It didn't destroy our faith. But it wasn't anything that we did as individuals, but it's what God did through us because without him, we couldn't have done it anyway. The one that created this universe will be the one who sustains this universe. And long after I'm gone, God is still the one that's in control. Now that you've seen the documentary and you've seen the adversity that our church had to go through, you can see that we couldn't have made it without somebody being in our lives. It's a personal relationship between man and God. Um, there's many things that can bring that relationship closer. You know, sin came into the world and separated a holy God from a sinful man. Well, people go to hell because of their refusing to accept Christ as personal Savior. The amazing thing about that is Christ doesn't want anybody to have to go there. He actually made that place for the devil and his angels. But Christ went to the cross to reunite that holy God to that man. That's the only way that man can come back into the presence of God now. As you've watched this documentary, I want you to consider the thought that you also can trust Christ as your personal Savior. That if you're going through a tragedy in your life, that Christ can sustain you also. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It also says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what it simply says is this, if you realize that you're a sinner, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that you too can trust Christ as your Savior, ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And He says, if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And the good thing about that is He says, all those that accept Him receive the gift. That gift is called eternal life. And what a joy it is to know that when you have eternal life, that one day you can spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. And it takes trials and tribulations sometimes to bring us back close and have that intimate personal relationship with Christ. And so it's, it's worth it. A lot of times folks ask, 
Where was God during this time of need? Where was he when you got flooded? Well, the amazing part is I remember a story where some folks had said that same prayer in the loss of a son. And they said, preacher, where was God at when my son died and I lost my child? And the preacher replied, well, God was the same place that his son died on the cross that day and that he was overlooking and he was still there. And even in the darkest of days, when we don't know where we're gonna go or where we're gonna turn, God's always there. The amazing thing about scripture is it teaches you this, that God never sleeps. And so if God never sleeps, he sees everything. He knows what's going on and he knows in the future what you and I can't see. And as a person out there that's a non-Christian, I could just tell them that God's still there regardless. And if you'll take time to listen to that still small voice in your soul, you'll hear it and you'll know too.